National Geographic Photographer. After the journey across Europe on the legendary Orient Express. For now, it's just another chapter in a career that's taken to the places most of us only dream about. The trip manager and all the crew of board wish you a very pleasant journey on board.
job is oftentimes not taking photographs, but surviving in the environment where I've gotten the photograph. I'm not a motion picture person, I'm not a cinematographer, I don't have 
don't have any emotion, I don't have sound, so I have to evoke the feeling of movement, perhaps, or the feeling of song. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's trying to put something into that one single image that will evoke the feeling you might get by looking at a sequence of images that tell you about the thing or the place. National Geographic magazine publishes more than a thousand pictures every year. And whether they're traditional in style or more avant-garde, they all must meet the same high standards. So, what makes a great photo? Just ask the photographers themselves. I'd like to think that an ideal National Geographic photograph is one.
列，就同一个，呃，那个女孩子，我刚刚表现出那种无奈啊、哦，然后，就是我们那个满脸的都是光啊，先不要走，好好吧。
can see that issue from across the room, and I know it's mine. My story's in there. I think it's true that the cover because it's a natural cover. Uh, it's a simple photograph. Because of the flags on the picture, the, the stance of the ball player, I think also even the fact he's wearing a woman on one. I mean, all these things kind of fall in place, and the light was gorgeous on that in the South Texas afternoon. The picture is the result of simply showing up for work on time. I got there, they played the national anthem, the light was very nice, not a difficult picture to make. The writer and I were lost in Dublin, overdue for an appointment in a remote suburb, and were really racing around Ireland looking for the right road. And we passed these four children with their horse. They were walking in front of a great stone wall and had this pony and the light was gentle and graceful. Someone saw them and moved them off the horn and they all looked. They looked off camera, the wind blew, and I took the photograph. One frame, one woman. Unaware. And that's the power of the photograph. A lot of times you know it instantly, you know it the very minute that you click the shutter, that the picture is there. Uh, a lot of other times it's surprising for me when you get home. For example, the picture of the women during the, the swings of the Saudi women cover. I didn't really realize at the time that that was going to be as compelling a picture as it was. You know, I, I saw the light and the movement and the shapes, but I didn't realize how the way her hip line goes would be quite so seductive and to work with the, uh, with the expression in her eyes. And if get on the swing would be going right at the moment that it was. Um, those things you don't know, you hope for the best. I think a cover needs to be simple, direct, and has to reach out and grab the reader. This picture was chosen for the cover because it kind of summed up the whole uh, play of that.
these earliest days, photographs of animals were among the reader's favorites, and geographic photographers were pioneers. On assignment around the world, they created astonishing portraits of creatures both familiar and exotic. But as the number of unexplored wild places dwindled, a new frontier was just being opened. With the development of the Aqualung in the 1940s, for the first time, man could explore and photograph the hidden world beneath the sea. An early convert was National Geographic photographer Louis Martin. In the magazine's first large-scale underwater stories, his groundbreaking pictures provided a startling look at the creatures of the deep. Martin's work helped to inspire the next generation of underwater photographers. One of the best is David Duvalet. In his 25 years of working for the Geographic, Duvalet has shot more than three dozen articles. His work keeps him in the field most of the time. I really would like to have a regular life. If I could, I'd like to live in New York, take the elevator downstairs and swim out to the street and take pictures. Home for dinner every night. Can't do it. I have to go to the ends of the earth. And then when I go to the ends of the earth, I have to go to water. Never, 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 ever say. I never say in the top days. I might miss something. I figure I've been under water. A hundred days a year since I've been 12. So three hours a day. I don't know what that adds up to, but it's a lot of time. Underwater is half shooting pictures, thinking about it, just getting back to hunting, finding the stuff. It's a little bit like trail craft, you know, walking through the woods. What's that? What's that sound? What's that thing? Why are these fish doing that? And after a while, you begin to learn how the sea works, and it's a very complex, very little understood place. And you've got to find things. Wildlife and the resulting photographs more than make up for all his. 
hard work and sacrifices. But he doesn't forget the readers. They too must be enlightened and transported by his experiences. I want somebody who looks at one of my pictures to cross that barrier to the page. And then go in and see. Basically, one of the ocean is or as corny as it sounds. But if they can sort of let themselves go and rattle around in the frame of the picture and feel the ocean, then it's a successful picture. Beverly Sobeyer and her husband Derek have the time they need 